And for that, we can praise him today. We can worship him. We can lift him up and give him the glory in this place. Amen. I, I want to preach to you today just from the simple title. The King of Glory is coming. The King of Glory is coming. Father, even now, you know that I am inadequate to uh, properly say everything that, that is uh, concerning you and to make it clear in and of myself. So I ask now, God, that your Holy Spirit move me, use me, until you use me up, God, to preach this glorious gospel, to let somebody out there know this morning that you are coming and you are coming soon. God, we depend on you and we need you today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my strength, hallelujah, and my redeemer. Thank you, God, and amen. Amen. The last few months is proof that you can be caught off guard. The last few months is proof that a virus can take humanity and so to speak turn us inside out and upside down the last few months have proven that we can be caught off guard and man can be caught in what he only knows best at times without the lord to do and you can look in scripture and it backs it up and we can be caught off guard and begin to play the blame game amen you know how the blame game works. You blame somebody else for your shortcomings. The other day, my son and I were out working and we saw a storm coming. And we kept working. We saw it in the distance. We saw it get closer. We saw the trees start to move and we kept working anyway. And we were caught in the downpour. <clears throat> Amen. If you remember what Noah did and how he his story is relayed in the, the, the truth of God's word in, in Genesis, the judgment came from God and God said, I'm going to flood the whole earth. And he prepared Noah and Noah preached righteousness because he lived a righteous life. Yet people saw and heard what he was doing and, and, and mocked and scorned and laughed. And the day came when the drops of rain began to fall and they were caught off guard. Minister Smith just read a scripture that I think is very important and, 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 and useful in today's text that I will get to in just a second. It is called the parable of the virgins, the 10 virgins. <clears throat> and it says that they had lamps that they were given with oil. They were told that the bridegroom is coming and he was delayed for whatever reason and five of them, as they fell asleep, they, they determined that when they woke up and heard the call that they didn't have enough oil. Because he was delayed, their oil had run low. And so they wanted to borrow somebody else's. Amen. And they were caught off guard. They had to go and find oil. And while they were gone, the bridegroom came and they missed out on his coming. They missed out on the celebration. And then they were told, I never knew you. I don't know you. You can't come in. Most reasonable people this morning, saints, and those of you who are listening, can see that a storm is on the horizon. We sang it last week. There's a storm out on the ocean. We preached to you last week. Don't be like a tumbleweed Christian. Don't be like a tumbleweed that just blown all over the place. Most reasonable people can see that there is a spiritual, supernatural storm, and it's not just on the horizon. We are in the midst of its beginning. You can see destruction in view and decay and de devolution of, of, of mindsets. Things are going down, and still there are people who are ignoring the sign. Yet, as I stand here and preach to you today, I want to let you know there is still room for one more in the ark of safety. There is still hope, and the king is coming, and the question that I want to leave with you today is, are you ready for his 
arrival. We spend hours prepping for vacations, trips, getting our tickets right, our accommodations set up, and making sure we have the boarding passes and, and vehicles ready to go, getting ready for our special vacation. We spend all kind of time, folks will start planning for cruises months and maybe even years in advance. I wanna ask you a simple question. Have you made your preparations for eternity? Do you have your ticket in hand? Or are you gambling on eternity with a hope so mentality? I hope I'm ready. <clears throat> I think I might be ready. You got to know that you're ready because here's the truth of the matter. And then we'll get to the text. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going. Yeah. Everybody singing about heaven ain't going. Everybody that folks have said fly high, they're not going. And that is a scary thought, it is a sobering thought. That the truth is that there are those who are still playing with God and have made up their mind that they will take a chance on eternity with a form of of godliness and denying his true power, denying his saving power. God says in his word, if you look at those texts that he read today, the parable of the foolish virgins, the ten virgins, look at what happened with Noah. God said in his word, you need to be right, you need to be real, and you need to be ready. The text today is coming from the 24th Psalm. And it says in the 24th Psalm that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who, do, who does not lift up his soul to what is false or to vanity, who does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? He is the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. We know God's word is already blessed. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, we see what happens as David <clears throat> is about ready to bring the ark of the covenant of God into Jerusalem. We know along the way he got into some trouble. Some people uh, handled the ark incorrectly. <clears throat> and he had to take it aside into Obed-Edom's house. We know from various sermons that I've preached here, and if you've read the Bible, that as he took it aside into Obed-Edom's house, David was both mad and scared of the ark. But then he saw that Obed-Edom's house began to be blessed. Oh, yeah, Obed-Edom got in the presence of the Lord, and Obed-Edom's house was blessed. Amen. If you remember what I preached to you, few months ago, Obed-Edom got blessed. His wife got blessed. His children got blessed. Amen. His cats got blessed. Hallelujah. Everybody got blessed in Obed-Edom's house. So David sees that there's blessing going on and he began to say, I'm going to bring the ark back to the holy city. And as he brings the ark back to the holy city, he 
brings it into the holy city. He brings it into Jerusalem. And every six steps or so, they dance and they sacrifice and they offer. Amen, Bible study, folks. They, they offer burnt offering to the Lord. They offer up their praise. And David dances. Every six paces he goes and he praises God. Can you see them as they're coming into the city? With the ark, there are those on the outside and those on the inside. And some group will sing uh, one thing, and then the next group inside will respond. Amen. They will respond back. And this is an example of call and response singing. We still have that in our churches where one person will say something and the group will respond to the question that they ask. As they get closer to the city of Jerusalem, David dances and the people sing. And it is from this that probably he wrote this 24th psalm. Now I just want to break it down into three sections today. The first few verses establish what David has written. He says simply about the king that we're praising. He said, this king owns everything. The king owns everything. So we have here a king writing about the king. He says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Praise the name of the Lord. David had a lot of stuff. David had wives and he had riches and he had kingdoms. He had all sorts of things. But here is David, a king, talking about the king. And he says the earth is the Lord's. That means everything that is on earth. Amen. As, as the, the writer of Philippians in the second chapter of Philippians says, those things above the earth, those in the earth, and those under the earth, everything belongs to God. David says not only does he own it all, but he is my maker. He is my owner. And I don't know about you today, church, but those of you who are watching, the older I get in him, the more I truly realize how much I owe him and how much he owns. Everywhere I've ever been, everything I've ever seen with the eyes that he gave me, he owns my eyes, he, he owns my mind, he owns the world. He is the ruler and the owner of this world. He is the maker and he owns it in the fullness thereof. David, you see, recognizes as he probably wrote in Psalms 103, 19 that the Lord has prepared his kingdom and his throne rules over all. Recognizing the earth is the Lord's. In fact, the simple children's song the kids have it right when they were kids. When we were kids we would sing this He's got the whole world in his hands. The most simplest of songs, but it is the truth. The earth is the Lord's. I want you to know right where you're sitting today, in your home, and the land that that home is built on, and this great country that we still abide in. I still believe it is a great country, even though we deny some simple truths of the Bible. I believe God has blessed us. And I keep praying, God, bless America. But I want you to know, America, it all belongs to the Lord. Amen. The world, the fullness thereof. For he says he has founded it upon the seas. John 1, 3 says all things that were made through him, Jesus made. And without nothing, without, without him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1.16 says, For him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He owns it. Can you say where you are today, Christ? He is the owner of all things. Amen. He created it. He spoke it into existence. See, that's the problem today. Folks don't want to give him credit for what he's made. Amen. I know there's folks out there that believe strongly in evolution. I, I, I'm going I'm to uh, feel sorry for you right now. You without excuse 
All you have to do is look up above. Look around you. Every time I go and am able to stand and look out at the ocean, Job said it best. He said, who is it? And it's even mentioned in Proverbs. Who is it that keeps the oceans in their boundaries? Where did all that water go that flooded the whole earth? That Noah rose up in that boat on top of and God protected him. Where did the water go? Scientists just found out a few years ago and, and made this great grand discovery that the Bible has been saying that there are oceans in the crust of the earth that are possibly bigger than the ones setting on the crust of the earth. That brings to mind what he said once again. He has founded it upon the seas and he has established it upon the rivers. Why don't you say this morning, God owns everything. Why does he own it? Why is his name on it? Because he's the master architect. He is the creator. He founded it. He built it. When he's good and ready, he'll tear it down. Amen. The Bible says that the Spirit of God stepped out onto nothing and spoke simple words. Let there be. And there was. He made it. He made the light. The lesser and the greater. He made the moon and the stars. He made the lands. He made the oceans. He made the animals. He made the fish, the plants. He made the very air that we breathe. And then the Bible says he didn't technically speak it, but he made man. He visibly and physically put his hands and scooped up the dirt of the earth and he breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul, giving him a mind a soul and a spirit. And you have to understand it is with that mind that you can look at creation and see that you didn't get here by yourself. God made you. He is the owner. The fullness thereof. God owns creation. He founded it. He has made it. He has placed everything in divine order. He appointed and built the foundations of everything we see. So it is with that knowledge in mind that as David considers, and I can connect this to Psalms 8, who am I that God would be mindful of me? That, that begs questions when you consider that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, when you consider that he has made everything and those that dwell therein, when you consider he has founded it upon the seas, when you think about and look at all creation, it must bring a question to mind. Who can stand in his presence? Who can stand before the king? So the second part of this is after the first part, the Lord owns everything. Then the second part, a, a point I want to make to you is then if he owns everything, who can stand in his presence? Each one of us, we have stood in the presence of some famous people. I've met some famous football players. I've met some famous people in, in college and, and other places. I've been in the same buildings with famous people, same area. You know, you can think sometimes we, we are, we're a culture that we, we get into people worship. Amen. We worship folks and we, we, we look at them and, and look at their status. But I want to say to you, they didn't make the earth. They didn't create things. So the question is, if God is who he says he is, then David poses a great question. Who can approach him? If he is who he said he is, who can abide in him? Who can stand to be in his presence? And the truth of the matter is, in your flesh, you could not stand to be in the very presence of God. Amen. My mother used to laugh and, 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 and tell me a story that when she was a smaller child and even a little bit older, she pictured God as this wise old man somewhat similar to the Wizard of Oz who was behind a curtain pushing the rain button, pushing the sun button, pushing the earthquake button, and, and he was just a wise old man with a long white beard, but she got to find out that he is not like that at all. He is simply a God that you can go into his presence if you have the right issue. Amen. 
If you have the right invitation, you can seek audience with him. So David says, if he has made all these things, and he is the owner of everything, who can stand before the king? That's why verses 3 and 4 of this chapter are very important. It says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Amen. What, what does it take, pastor? What does it take, preacher, to get into his presence? You see, for David as the king, you have to seek audience with the king. You couldn't just come in any time and bust into the room as you wanted to. You had to have an invitation. But David says, for, for, for this king, for this God, he said, you must have clean hands. Yeah, yeah. And a pure heart. You've got to take some things off to get into heaven. Nowadays, everybody is focusing on wearing a mask to gain entry into places. You can't get in places without a mask. I was turned away the other day in a different state because I didn't have a mask. I, I could not get in. But I want you to know it takes more than a mask to get into heaven. In fact, you've got to take a mask off to get into heaven. You've got to take off the pretense of worship and your forms of godliness and what Jesus said, your form of filthy rags and your form of what you think worship is. And you've got to come in with clean hands. And a pure heart. You see, I thought about this. The text doesn't mention it, but it certainly works. A mask, or as my son used to call it when he was little, a paper hat. Amen. A mask will hide what your real identity is. How do you know that if God is the maker of everything, you can't hide what's in your heart? You can't hide it. It's already laid bare before him. And even though we put on the mask of I look good and I'm this and I'm that, the Lord actually knows where you are and what you are and what you're doing. So that's why David says you've got to have clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. A lot of folks with masks on today for various reasons. But once again, God knows your heart. He knows your hands. He knows where you've been. He knows your emotions. He knows your intellect. He knows where you are mentally. So David again has written who can approach God. And the answer is only those who are hid in Jesus Christ. Why is that, Pastor? Because Jesus, praise the name of the Lord, he is the only one with clean hands and a pure heart. You see, even David, as he wrote this, he realized, I'm a king, but I'm not qualified. Stay with me. I'm a king, but I'm not qualified because David, he was a murderer. Mm, yeah, he, he was an adulterer. He saw Bathsheba, and he wanted her when he saw her, and he had her husband put on the front lines, and he died on the front lines. David's hands were dirty. David's heart was stained. That's why he had to write in Psalms 51, give me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. In his son, Solomon, he was a king, but he was an idolater. He worshiped other gods. Hezekiah, as great as he was, he was lifted up in pride. And you know what? If walls could talk, all of us in here, all of you who are watching, we have dirty hands and our heart has not been pure. So who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. You see what David is writing in this text, and it's an Old Testament text, but you certainly can see it through the New Testament. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our go-between. Jesus is our representative. Jesus is our advocate. He is our savior. And you can only get to heaven. You can only get into the presence of the Lord with his access. So the question begs to be asked today, do you have clean hands? Do you have a pure heart? No, but Jesus does. And if I'm in him and he's in me, 
amen, then I can go to God. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father unless he comes by me. He who has clean hands, thank you, Jesus, and a pure heart. The Bible says there is a generation, amen, that seek after him. He will receive, verse 5, the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. I love the song that we sang last week, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. There is a particular verse that says, And when I will stand before him, I will have to be dressed in his righteousness alone. How do you know that before a holy God, your righteousness won't get it? Before a holy God, you're trying and trying to be right and just trying to make it in. You're trying to come up the rough side of the mountain. You're trying to do what's right. It won't get you in. You've got to be dressed in the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He says, such is the generation, amen, verse 6, who seek after him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob, Selah. So that, that word face there means they seek, look at it, verse 5 and 6, a personal relationship. When you are face to face with somebody, that means that you are in an intimate relationship. You know them person to person. Such is a generation. And I believe that God is seeking after people, even in these down and dark times, even in these times of pandemic, he is seeking people that will come into covenant relationship with him face to face. Seek him early and often. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. You know what, this is going to sound weird, but I'm glad that this pandemic has happened. If it has happened for nothing more than to get people to wake up and realize that there's a God who seeks relationship with you and you need to get into his presence. There are people who never would have looked at church websites, never would have stepped foot in the church, never would have considered God. But because of this, they have gotten down on their knees and asked God, can I come in to your presence? Who can enter? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. There's a generation that seek after this God. Seek after him face to face. And heaven will be filled with generations of seekers and finders. Generations of those who have possessed and enjoyed the blessings of God. Amen. Verse 5. The, the heaven will be filled with those who have sought and have went after the Lord. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You seek him face to face. Selah. So if the Lord owns everything, and he has created it all, Amen. And he has established it. And he is who he says he is. The question arises, who can stand in his presence? That great of a king. He, he is the king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Who can stand in his presence? So then David closes this psalm out by saying simply point number three. That it spoke to me these, these simple words. Have you made room for the king? Yeah. Have you made room for the king? Because understanding who he is, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, who can come into his presence, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. I can only find that in Jesus Christ. So if that is the case, then we must be like the the understanding the parable of the virgins, you've got to have your lamp prepared. you got to have oil in your lamp. And who is the only one that can give you oil? It is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is Jesus the Christ. So the question comes, have you made room for the king? Pastor, where, where does that come from? Well, look what it says. It says in verse 7 through 10, and keep in mind, 
whether it was David coming into the city of Jerusalem, or we could even say Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem thousands of years later with, with the triumphant entry into uh, uh, Jerusalem on the, the Palm Sunday. Have you made room for the king? Those people there, they, they praised him on a Sunday, so to speak. But then by Friday, they were ready to crucify him. They were yelling and screaming for his death. It doesn't matter. The question is to be asked in front of all of us today. Have I, have you made room for the king? For the king. It says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be ye lifted up, ye ancient doors, and the king of glory shall come in. What that denotes is this, as they entered into the holy city, they would call out and say, lift up the gates, the king is coming. Amen. It would be simple or kind of like you saying, who's coming, who's the man, it's not just any old person coming, but it's the king. He's coming. Amen. And I want to be ready. I, I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. How about you? Revelation 19, 11 through 16 says that one day the king will return to his throne. You see, the first time he came, he came as a king and the wise men recognized him and they brought him gifts. And then they took this king to a cross on Calvary and they didn't recognize him as king. They made fun of him. They, they said, king of the Jews, here he is. They hung a sign up. But when he comes the next time, every eye will see him. And the Bible says, and they will wail at the sight of the one that they pierced. One day he's going to return to receive his bride. And that's the church. And to claim his inheritance his kingdom, the earth, and all that dwells therein, it will be, if you're, if you're going to be a part of it, you're going to have to be under the blood, but he will return to receive all that belongs to him. So verses 7 through 10 gives us an important fact. There has to be lifting up of gates. And <clears throat> that refers to making the gates higher and larger so that a glorious king can come in. Amen. If you remember in Matthew 21, 1 through 10, they said, Hosanna, O magnify the Lord with me. Amen. So what that is saying is as the, as the king prepares to enter, they have to raise the gates higher so that he can come in. The question today is, have you raised your gates so that he can come in? Have you raised your gates so that he can come in? The gates must be stretched to make room for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Gates in doing so is a personification of a participation to worship. Do you understand that we must stretch ourselves to prepare for his arrival? Amen. He is not looking for just anyone, but those who have come under the blood, those who have surrendered their lives to him, those who have placed their all on the altar, those who are withholding nothing. He stretches us. And in some rights, gates can be considered also people of God. You have to stretch to make room for him. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Have you made room for the king because the king of glory is coming amen it says in fact that he is the lord of hosts <clears throat> he will fight your battles he is the lord of armies and I want to close out and let you know that he did not call his armies on that Friday Hello, somebody. He, he could have called a legion of angels. He is the commander of heaven's armies, but he didn't call for them because he knew that Calvary had to happen. He knew without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sin. So he allowed cruel men to hang him on the cross of Calvary. And there he died on that Friday. I want you to know, but he did not stay dead. He rose up early on a Sunday morning. Have you made room for the king of glory? He is coming. 
He is coming. So if Christ is your good shepherd and you have received him as your savior and you let him be your great shepherd, then God will bless your life. And when the chief shepherd returns, your gates will be extended to meet him. For if you are following along with this psalm and understanding the parallel, when they got to the outside of the city, they would call out, who is this king that's with us? And from the inside, they would say, the king of glory, the king, the mighty king. But one of these days, it's going to come out this way. When he comes back for his children, Jesus, the rose of Sharon, Jesus, the fairest of 10,000, Jesus, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords, he's going to come and stand in the clouds. First Thessalonians 4 says so. And he's going to call his church to himself. Those who have died in Christ, he will bring their souls back, reunite them with the glorified body. We which are walking around will be caught up to be with them in the air. And then he's going to snatch us up through the first heaven. That's where the birds fly. That's where the planes fly. He's going to snatch us up through the second heaven. Amen. That's where Jupiter goes around. That's where the sun shines. That's where the moon reflects the sun. And he's going to take us in to the third heaven. But can you hear them inside of heaven say, who is this king of glory? As we're about to enter in and we are with him, the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And from the inside of the gates of heaven, they will say he is the king of glory. He is the Lord strong and mighty. He is the Lord that will fight your battle. Who is this king of glory? He is Jesus the Christ. He is the one that was pierced for my salvation. He is the soon coming king of glory. And the Bible says we'll enter in to those gates and there will be a time like we've never seen before. There's a great coronation that's going to happen and we will throw our crowns at his feet and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I've got loved ones that I'll see again. I've got ones that have gone on before me. I'll see Paul. I'll see Abraham. I'll see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But here's what I want to see. I want to see Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the King of glory. Are you ready for his coming? Stretch your gates so that he can come in to your heart. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. If he has not come into your life today, I challenge you right now where you are that you stretch yourself and say, Lord, I don't know you as close as I need to know you. I want you to come into my life. I realize and I look and see the signs of what's happening. I realize you're coming again and I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be like the five virgins that didn't have enough oil. I want to be ready when you come. There's a simple way to do that. It's to bow your head right now before a holy God and ask him into your life. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life. I surrender all to you right now. All to you I owe. I trust that you died for me. I trust that you were buried for me. And I trust that you rose again for me. And I place my faith in you and nothing else. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you do 